Hello, my name is Asia Darbinian, and I'm the Executive Director of Change, the Center for Holocaust, Human Rights, and Genocide Education, housed at Brookdale Community College in Lanecroft, New Jersey, on the territory of Lenny Lenape people. Allow me to welcome you to Change's program commemorating the November pogrom, also known as Kristallnacht. Thank you for joining us this evening. We're living in difficult times when Change's mission to educate about the Holocaust, genocide, and human rights, and promote the elimination of racism, anti-Semitism, and all forms of prejudices, unfortunately, of utmost importance and relevance. I want to underscore the importance of every one of you choosing to be here tonight and to be educated more because at change we believe that education is key for never again to become more than just a slogan. First, a couple of uh, quick housekeeping items regarding tonight's program. Um, you will note that your audio is muted. It will remain muted throughout the program, uh, but the chat feature is enabled. So please feel free to communicate with one another through the chat box. Um, please feel free also to type your questions into the chat box. And at the end of the presentation, we will get to as many as possible time provided. Before we begin, I would also like to thank Change's staff, Suzanne Esterman, Rachel McCauley, Susan Yellen, and our board member and volunteer, Linda Milston, for making this program possible. An extra warm thank you to our program sponsors, including Pam and our doorman, Mimi and Jack Warbler, Fran and Rich Samaya, as well as to our generous donors and members. Today marks 85 years since the November pogrom. On November 9 and 10 of 1938, Nazi leadership, with the help of ordinary people, unleashed a series of pogroms against the Jewish population across the entire German Reich. Many of you may know this event as the Kristallnacht, German for Night of Broken Glass. Because of the shattered glass, that littered the streets after the vandalism and the destruction of Jewish-owned businesses, synagogues, and homes. Kristallnacht was the name given by the Germans, the perpetrators. We all know that Germans used language as one of their many ways to dehumanize their victims. Hence, Holocaust and genocide scholars, educators refrain from using the language of perpetrators. Here at Change, we deliberately refer to Kristallnacht as the November pogrom, reflecting the language commonly used by the survivors in our community and beyond to describe the mass violence they experienced, but also to reflect the complexity of the violence and the deep roots of it in the past experiences of Jewish communities. After all, the term pogrom is the Russian word meaning violent riot attack accompanied by destruction historically referred to violent attacks on Jewish communities in the Russian Empire. During the November 1938 pogrom, in a deliberate assault on the core symbols of Jewish identity, synagogues across Germany and Austria were looted, desecrated, burned by the SS, SA, Hitler Youth, and by ordinary citizens joining in. Many Jewish cemeteries were vandalized and defiled. Shops in Jewish ownership were looted and systematically destroyed across Germany. Apartments of Jewish Germans were plundered and ransacked. And about 30,000 Jewish men were rounded up simply for being Jewish and deported to concentration camps. The November pogrom that became, began 85 years ago today represented the greatest pre-war atrocity committed by the Nazi regime against Germany's Jewish population. Tonight, in his talk, Nuremberg and the November Pogrom, A Reckoning, our guest speaker, Dr. Lawrence Douglas, 
will examine why the Nuremberg trial failed to condemn any members of the Nazi leadership for the crimes of the pogrom. It is my pleasure to introduce Professor Lawrence Douglas to our virtual audience tonight. Dr. Douglas is the James Grossfeld Professor and Chair of Law, Jurisprudence and Social Thought at Amherst College. Professor Douglas is the author of seven books, including The Memory of Judgment, Making Law and History in the Trials of the Holocaust by Yale University Press, and The Right Wrong Man, John Demianuk and the Last Great Nazi War Crimes Trial by Princeton University Press. His commentary and essays have appeared in Harper's, The New York Times, The Washington Post, and The Los Angeles Times. He is a regular contributor to the Times Literary Supplement and The Guardian US. Professor Douglas is the recipient of major fellowships from the National Endowment for Humanities, United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, Institute for International Education, American Academy in Berlin, and Carnegie Foundation. Thank you for joining us this evening, Professor Douglas. And now I will mute myself and hand it over to you. Well, first of all, thank you very much for that very gracious uh, introduction, Asa. And I want to uh, basically thank everyone uh, associated with Change uh, for this um, honor to speak to you uh, tonight. Um, I'm actually going to pick up right where your introduction kind of uh, had left off about um, this term Kristallnacht. Um, because as you point out, the very term, how do we talk about this uh, event, um, it remains a matter of, of controversy. Uh, so as you pointed out, um, Kristallnacht literally means, uh, really just means crystal night. It doesn't even mean night of broken glass, so that's how more it's, it's more um, colloquially understood. And yet historians actually still remain a little bit confused as to where the term actually came from. Um, at least we know that its first recorded use um, probably was about a half year after uh, the events of November 9th. Uh, it was used in a Nazi, in a speech at a Nazi rally in June 1939. And uh, later it came into quite wide circulation in uh, post-war uh, Germany. Um, but as you also suggested, by the late 1970s, the, the term itself had, had begun to fall into disfavor. Now, in part, uh, this was because it was somewhat mistakenly thought uh, to have originated from the Nazis themselves as specifically an ironic trivialization of the violence. Uh, but more generally and more rightly, people observed, um, as you pointed out, um, that the night witnessed far more than just the smashing of glass. So just kind of look at a couple of images here. I mean, for example, uh, as you mentioned, uh, this orchestrated violence resulted in destruction of some 267 uh, synagogues. And as you also noted, uh, this was not just in Germany proper, but also in Austria. Austria, as you recall, had already been annexed into the uh, German Reich and also in uh, the Sudetenland. And remember, that was the um, area of Czechoslovakia, which only weeks earlier, uh, Britain and France had essentially ceded to Hitler in what we now understand as this kind of epically failed effort uh, at appeasement. And again, almost just kind of repeating what you said, that paramilitary members of the SS and the SA, uh, and they were aided, as you noted, by members of the Hitler Youth and also by ordinary Germans. Uh, they attacked and destroyed more than 7,000 Jewish businesses. And here's a destroyed business in, um, in Berlin. And quite alarmingly, we see these people enjoying some uh, moment of mirth as they go by the shattered business. And as you also noted, the 30,000 uh, Jewish men were seized and uh, sent to concentration camps. And uh, it's also a little bit difficult to estimate how many um, Jewish citizens were, were actually murdered that night. Um, it's hard to calculate, but historians now estimate that the number reaches into the, to the hundreds. Um, as a result of that, this term uh, Kristallnacht, it, it did fall into disfavor, not just in the German-speaking world, but in the United States uh, as well. 
And uh, as you pointed out, it's now typically referred to as the November pogrom. Um, but I'm not necessarily convinced that that term is a huge improvement. Um, because as you noted, the term pogrom is typically associated with this kind of these spasms of anti-Jewish violence that long convulsed um, Eastern Europe and Russia. And it doesn't seem exactly properly applied to a nationwide coordinated act of terror that was really carried out by the apparatus of a modern uh, nation state. So for better or worse, tonight I'll probably continue to use the term um, Kristallnacht and maybe I'll interchange it with the word a November pogrom. Uh, the other thing I think we should also bear in mind is there wasn't anything particularly happenstance about that date, November 9th. Um, at the time, the, uh, the Nazis, of course, claimed that it was a case of uh, spontaneous violence uh, by the German population um, as they expressed their outrage at the uh, assassination of a Nazi diplomat in uh, Paris by a young a Jewish uh, teenager named um, Herschel Grinspan. Um, but of course, as I noted, this was not an example of spontaneous violence. This was a state orchestrated attack. And November 9th, 1938, we should note, uh, marked the 15th anniversary of Hitler's failed Munich Beer Hall putsch, again, 1923. And that date, that date of uh, November 9th, 1923, it kind of emerged as um, a date with mythical significance within the Nazi, um, the Nazi ideology. And so in recalling that earlier moment, uh, Kristallnacht marked a radicalization of Nazi anti-Semitic violence that, which, that would, of course, reach its uh, culmination in um, their exterminatory acts against the Jewish population of Europe. Now tonight, um, as you suggested, I, I really wanna talk about the legal reckoning with Kristallnacht. I'm basically at, at heart a legal scholar and I hope this doesn't get too legal. Um, and I'll try to keep my, my, my comments to probably about another like half hour, 35 minutes or so since in my understanding have a long career of teaching is that the idea of a long good lecture is almost a contradiction in terms. So I'll try to keep this relatively uh, brief so that we can have ample time for um, conversation and questions. So I suppose the first question we could ask is, was anyone ever convicted of the crimes of that night? And that might sound like a pretty straightforward uh, question, but actually it's not. Uh, and really to answer that question, we're going to have to look at whether the attacks on synagogues, businesses, people, whether all this uh, concentrated violence, whether it actually constituted crimes either under German law on the one hand, or maybe under international law on the other. And again, we, that might seem like a straightforward question, but I think we'll find out that the answer is actually pretty complicated. And it really brings us, I think, to the heart of uh, post-war attempts to bring perpetrators of Nazi atrocities um, to justice. <clears throat> so to start this, um, this kind of a legal inquiry, I wanna um, move to uh, 1965 and to a, um, an interview that was published in this uh, German newspaper, German magazine, uh, Der Spiegel. Uh, Der Spiegel is basically what we might think of as um, what Time Magazine used to be, kind of the, the weekly magazine of record. Um, and in this uh, 1965 uh, edition of Der Spiegel, um, there was a lengthy interview that was published, um, and the interview was conducted by Der Spiegel's editor, um, this guy named uh, Rudolf Augstein, and he was interviewing probably the most prominent German philosopher of the time, a uh, philosopher named Karl Jaspers. And the topic was whether Germany, and by Germany, we're really talking about West Germany, uh, whether Germany should continue to actively pursue the prosecution of uh, former Nazis. And uh, Augstein asked a pretty provocative uh, question uh, to the philosopher Jaspers. And, and I'm just gonna quote directly from the question that uh, the publisher Augstein asked him. So here's a direct quotation. 
During the conquest of Jaffa, Napoleon took 3,000 prisoners. And to save on powder and bullets, he had them all bayoneted to death. Many of these captives were in company of their families, and these families were also slaughtered. Nevertheless, no one suggested that anyone besides Napoleon should be held responsible for this massacre. By contrast, today, in the case of Nazi crimes, we act as if it's typical and proper to put on trial anyone who may have shot women and children under orders. Now, the philosopher didn't particularly like this question and pushed back pretty aggressively against them. And so this was the answer of Karl Jaspers, this prominent philosopher. So this is a direct quotation. Don't we need to recognize an essential difference? History knows many such stories as the one about Napoleon. In this case, the representative of the state, Napoleon, committed a crime. But the state, in its essence and entirety, was not criminal. The decisive point is to recognize that the Nazi state was a Verbrecherstaat, a criminal state, not a state that just happened to commit crimes. And so I just want to have us pause and, and, and think about that statement of this philosopher Karl Jaspers, that the Nazi state was a Verbrecherstaat, that is a criminal state, not a state that happened to commit crimes. And I think we need to, to pause over this claim um, because uh, some of you out there might have studied uh, politics or law, and you would know that the term criminal state or Verbrecherstaat, it, it almost sounds like an oxymoron, a contradiction in terms. So if, if you studied any traditional uh, political or legal thought, uh, you might know that um, you know, legal and political thinkers were all basically committed to the proposition that the state, the state was the guarantor of security, order, and lawfulness. Now, obviously, obviously individual state actors could behave in bad ways. And that's what Augustine was asking about someone like a Napoleon. And, you know, even hypothetically speaking, we could say like a former president, you know, could th theoretically be indicted for having committed crimes. But the point was that the state itself still was understood as, as basically the source of order. And the state itself was restrained by the very laws that it promulgated. But Jaspers realized, and this was really his insight, that Nazi crimes exploded this model, that Nazism had really deformed the state and had made the state into really the principal perpetrator of crimes, the very agent of criminality. So far from er, uh, serving as a restraint, the law, at least arguably, had served as a tool of the crimes of this Verbrecherstadt criminal state. Now, the advent of a real criminal state, it posed then extremely difficult and complicated problems for the law. And uh, in his opening address uh, at Nuremberg, and here's just a, uh, an image of the defendants uh, in the dock at the Nuremberg trial. In his opening address at Nuremberg, uh, the chief of the American prosecution, uh, Robert Jackson, he might be a name that's familiar to some of you, Jackson uh, had taken a leave of absence from his position as a, an associate justice on the US Supreme Court to basically run the American prosecution at Nuremberg. Jackson specifically in his opening address, he, he dealt with the problem posed by the Verbrecherstaat. And he asked the question, he asked, he posed the, the question this way. He said, civilization asks whether law is to be so laggard as to be utterly helpless to deal with crimes of this magnitude by criminals of this order of importance. Now, Nuremberg, I think, offered a very distinctive answer to Jackson's question. First of all, we should bear in mind that as a joint exercise of the United States, uh, uh, Great Britain, France, and the Soviet Union, uh, Nuremberg really was the first international criminal trial in human history, in human history. And the trial obviously sought to demonstrate that law was adequate to the task of 
of dealing with the problems of this criminal state. But the effort would require extraordinary legal will and innovations. And perhaps most of all, mastering the crimes of this Nazi uh, criminal state would require first and foremost recognizing novel categories of wrongdoing. And I hope this is clear and becomes clearer as, as uh, we continue this evening, but these new categories, they had to be understood as expressive of binding international law. And that this binding international law had to be understood as standing above any kind of domestic national law that is basically trumping any domestic national law. And the reason I say that is that Nuremberg then stood for the proposition that even let's say, assuming that Nazis could argue that the atrocities they had committed had been authorized under then operative Nazi law, they could still be condemned because they had violated this law of deeper pedigree, namely international criminal law. So in this way, Nazi perpetrators could be held criminally liable before this brand new international court. And Nuremberg recognized uh, two novel categories of criminal wrongdoing uh, that was meant to reach the specific atrocities that had been committed by the Nazi regime. And these two kind of novel categories that were recognized at Nuremberg were uh, crimes against peace and, uh, and crimes against humanity. And when you're looking at here, you don't need to read through this whole thing, but this basically are just the, this is a list of the three substantive international crimes that were brought against the defendants at Nuremberg. And war crimes already had been clearly recognized uh, in international law going back really to the end of the 19th century. And the main innovations at Nuremberg were to recognize this thing called crimes against peace and this thing called crimes against humanity. Now, Nuremberg was not in the first instance a trial about atrocities against Europe's Jewish population. The actual main charge against the 21 defendants who he just a moment ago saw in a photograph of them in the dock at Nuremberg, the main charge that was brought against them was that they had committed this first thing over here, crimes against peace. That was really the main focus of the prosecution's case, that, that they had planned and waged a war of aggression in violation of international law. Again, that's the main principal charge that was brought at Nuremberg. But at the same time, uh, Nuremberg also conferred recognition on this other thing of crimes against humanity. And uh, that was the charge uh, under which allied prosecutors used to bring a lot of the evidence of the Holocaust before the International Tribunal. And it was also, it was also the charge that prosecutors used to bring evidence of the November pogrom before the court. So the violence of Kristallnacht, it wasn't a central feature of the Nuremberg prosecution, but it certainly did figure in presentations by Nuremberg prosecutors, in particular by American prosecutors and also by uh, some of their Soviet uh, colleagues. However, uh, when the allied judges uh, pronounced their judgment against the defendants in, uh, in October of 1946, and they did convict uh, 18 of the 21 defendants variously with crimes against peace, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. Um, the atrocities of the November pogrom, Kristalna, figured in none of these convictions. And why is that? Well, to understand why, we need to look more closely at this thing over here. The crimes against humanity and how Nuremberg understood those crimes. And to understand that, we also need to kind of stand back a little bit and again to look at traditional understandings in international law that is even before Nuremberg. And uh, if you look at international law before Nuremberg, international law hadn't generally involved itself with the state's treatment of its own legal subject. That is how a state treated its own citizens or legal subjects 
was generally understood to be its own business. And the idea was that that posture was really supposed to serve the interests of international stability. That is, the, it was thought that international stability would suffer if states were constantly passing judgment on how other states were treating their own. So don't butt in was basically kind of the uh, rule of the day. And in his opening address at Jackson, uh, in his opening um, address at Nuremberg, Jackson, and here's actually a uh, image of Justice Jackson offering his, uh, delivering his opening address at Nuremberg. Uh, Jackson explicitly recognized this traditional understanding. And so this is a quote from Jackson. He said, how a government treats its own inhabitants generally is thought to be no concern of other governments or of international society. But Jackson went on, Nazi Germany was different. So this is the quote from uh, Jackson. The German mistreatment of Germans is now known to pass in magnitude and savagery any limits of what is tolerable by modern civilization. So here I think we can say that Jackson suggests that the Nazis exceptionally murderous violence towards its, their own Jewish population turned this domestic mis mistreatment into an elevated it into an international crime. But here's where things get a little confusing, because in the very next breath, Jackson says something very differently. And here's this quote from Jackson. Nazi persecutions take the character as international crimes because of the purpose for which they were undertaken. The purpose of getting rid of the Jews was to clear their obstruction to the precipitation, to the precipitation of aggressive war. And he goes on to say, the Nazis attack on the peace of the world, that is their crimes against peace, the Nazis attack on the peace of the world is the crime against international society, which brings into international cognizance crimes in its aid and preparation, which otherwise might be only internal concerns. Now, some of you might that's a mouthful. So let's let's just kind of go through that a little bit carefully. So we're all kind of rowing in the same boat. So let's just pause over this because it does look like Jackson is saying two very different things. So at first, we heard him declare that the acts such as the atrocities of Kristallnacht constituted international crimes. Why? Because what Jackson has said was that they passed in magnitude and savagery any limits of what is tolerable by modern civilization. But then we heard him say something quite different. What we heard him say was that the pre-war violence against German Jews is an international crime because of its connection with another international crime, namely the Nazis planning and waging of aggressive war. Now, this second understanding uh, came to be known as the as Nuremberg's nexus requirement. And again, just so we're rowing in the same boat, because I know this gets a little bit complicated, the nexus requirement meant that Nuremberg would treat the Nazis' pre-war domestic atrocities against German Jews as crimes against humanity, but only if the prosecution could draw a connection between, a connection that is a nexus, between these pre-war acts and the Nazis' later war of aggression. Now, here's an image of the actual, uh, the judges, the tribunal at, uh, at Nuremberg. And, um, and so let's look at how the tribunal, the judges, uh, made sense of crimes against humanity in their final judgment. So this is now a direct quotation from their final judgment. With regards to crimes against humanity, there is no doubt whatsoever that in Germany before the war, a policy of terror was carried out on a vast scale and in many cases was organized and systematic and the persecution of Jews during this period is established beyond all doubt. Wow, that sounds very much like Jackson's first argument. But we just need to read on to the next sentence and then the tribunal says this, quote, revolting and horrible 
as many as these crimes were, it has not been satisfactorily proved that they were done in preparation or connection with the Nazis' war of aggression. The tribunal therefore cannot make a general declaration that the acts before 1939 were crimes against humanity within the meaning of the charter. Or again, to put it in other uh, words, the Nuremberg Tribunal concluded that lacking a nexus or connection to aggressive war, the violence of the November pogrom did not constitute a crime over which the court had jurisdiction. Now, a question that I think you immediately would want to ask yourself if you're following this somewhat involved but important argument is why did Nuremberg create this kind of weird restriction on crimes against humanity? What logic did this nexus or connection requirement serve? Well, before Nuremberg actually started, in the summer of 1945, legal representatives of the United States and the UK and France and the Soviet Union, they all gathered in London and they basically got together to basically discuss exactly what the reach of these crimes were that uh, the Nuremberg trial would be handling. And uh, in discussing crimes against uh, humanity, uh, Jackson said the following. He was a participant in this conference as well, a very important participant. And he said the following. He said, quote, we have some regrettable circumstances at home in our own country in which minorities are unfairly treated. Now, why did he bring this up? Well, clearly Jackson and his American colleagues were concerned about the precedent that the allies were about to create at Nuremberg. So for example, could a Southern governor who enforced Jim Crow laws suddenly be accused of perpetrating crimes against humanity by some future international court? And Jackson wasn't alone about fearing that too robust or too broad a concept of crimes against humanity could possibly ensnare domestic officials. Uh, in particular, the Soviets with their long record of domestic terror and repression and liquidations, they supported restricting the reach of crimes against humanity, as did the British delegate concerned about uh, activities that had taken place, let's say, in the British Empire. And so by limiting the reach of crimes against humanity to those that were committed in the furtherance of the Nazis' war of aggression, Allied jurists essentially sought to limit their own country's uh, possible future legal exposure. And so as a result of that, the terror of um, Kristallnacht uh, went unpunished. Well, does that mean that no one who orchestrated um, or participated in the atrocities of Kristallnacht or the November program was ever convicted of a crime? And interestingly, there were convictions. Uh, German courts in the late 1940s actually convicted a number of people associated with the violence of the November program. Uh, and they were convicted of crimes against humanity. And it's kind of odd because in a certain way, the convictions by these West German courts looks almost like a complete inversion of what transpired at Nuremberg. So at Nuremberg, the tribunal clearly handed down convictions against defendants who had participated in the Nazi wartime extermination of the Jewish population of Europe. Those people were convicted of crimes against humanity. Uh, but as we've noticed, no one associated with the atrocities of Kristallnacht um, was convicted. The German courts during the occupation period conducted numerous trials involving people involved with Kristallnacht, but they hardly touched any wartime acts of wartime mass extermination directed against the Jewish population of Europe. Now, why is that? Why do we have this kind of odd bifurcation in the cases that these courts were handling? And again, the answer is uh, it's a little legally involved, but I hope you understand how important it is to, when, when we're trying to deal with these, these crimes of a criminal state. So I think the answer is 
really lies in the occupation law, uh, in, in the allied occupation law that was applied uh, to early West German courts. Now we need to remember that with Germany's unconditional surrender at the end of World War II, the Nazi state and its entire court system essentially collapsed. And by late 1945, the allied governing body for occupied Germany, they recognized that they needed to reconstitute, they needed to build back a, a fledgling uh, German legal system. But the allies didn't exactly trust these kind of reconstituted German courts, which really by dint of necessity ended up employing an awful lot of former Nazi judges. And so what did the allies do? Well, what they did is they said, well, we're gonna give these courts jurisdiction over certain domestic matters. So for example, these freshly reconstituted, uh, reconstituted German courts We'll let them deal with cases, let's say, with dealing with petty theft and robbery, and even killings that only occurred during the occupation period. That is, that's going on right now, meaning between, let's say, 45 and 49. We trust them to deal with those kinds of cases, but we do not trust them to deal properly with the grand crimes of the Nazi regime, the extermination of the European Jews. But the Allied occupiers did carve out a narrow exception to that rule. They granted these fledgling uh, German courts jurisdiction over pre-war, again, here's a quote, crimes committed by persons of German citizenship or nationality against other persons of German citizenship or nationality. For such ca cases, German courts were granted jurisdiction over Nazi era crimes. Now, why this exception? Well, we already saw that at Nuremberg, these allied jurists struggled with the longstanding legal principle that a state's treatment of its own subject, subjects is generally understood to be an entirely domestic concern. And again, just to repeat, just so we're all clear on this, and we've seen that as a consequence of that thinking, Nuremberg ultimately concluded that all pre-war atrocities, notably the violence of Kristallnacht, they didn't constitute crimes against humanity because the court only had jurisdiction over crimes against humanity that were connected to the main international crime at Nuremberg, the Nazis' war of aggression. But Allied occupies reason that German courts, well, German courts, they didn't face any similar jurisdictional problems dealing with pre-war domestic atrocities because after all, these fledgling German courts would be trying Germans for acts committed against other Germans, namely German Jews. And so they, can, could, they could convict former Nazis who participated uh, in the Kristallnacht for crimes against humanity. And so it was interesting in this one area, the German courts, fledgling as they were, they could do something that the Nuremberg trial was not authorized to do. Now, I suppose maybe the, the final irony is that um, once Germany reclaimed its full sovereignty in 1949, its domestic trials involving crimes against humanity ground to an abrupt halt. Almost immediately, German jurists, who are now free of this yoke of allied oversight, these German jurists, they almost immediately concluded that because crimes against humanity, now get this, because crimes against humanity, had not been formally recognized as crimes until Nuremberg, that now charging former Nazis with these crimes would be a bar against retroactive law. And again, some of you might be familiar with this, uh, this maxim of nullum crimen sine lege. And again, that, or if you're not familiar with the Latin, you're probably familiar with the, uh, the American notion, no ex post facto law. So the idea is that there can't be any criminal liability in the absence of some kind of pre-existing criminal statute. So once freed of allied oversight, these German courts suddenly concluded that trying former Nazis for crimes against humanity would involve an impermissible application of ex post facto law. As you can probably imagine, this conclusion wasn't 
uh, wasn't greeted uh, all that um, uh, happily by other European countries. They all rejected the German conclusion. But as a practical matter, it meant that just at the moment, that is, once they were granted full sovereignty, just at the moment when German prosecutors were, were granted jurisdiction over all Nazi era crimes, not just over pre war German and German crimes, but also about crimes of the Holocaust, now they suddenly rejected the very legal tool that Allied prosecutors had pioneered at Nuremberg to facilitate prosecutions like this. Well, once German jurists in the reconstituted German state concluded Germans could not be tried for crimes against humanity, they faced a really huge legal problem. And the problem was, what charges could post-war German prosecutors bring against former Nazis in Germany? Again, we have to kind of think this thing pretty carefully. Because recall that the advantages of relying on crimes against humanity was the following, that as an, in, as an article of international law, it was understood to trump domestic national law. That is so that even if someone came along and said, hey, what I was doing was authorized by my domestic law, judges at Nuremberg could say, it doesn't matter. Because even if you were authorized by domestic law, you're violating international law, and we can still condemn you for violating international law. But once German jurists rejected crimes against humanity as a charge to be brought against former Nazis, now they were faced with really this huge problem. So if we just kind of think about uh, the November pogrom, we can frame the problem that they confronted in these terms. Post-war uh, prosecutors had to argue either one of the two things. So this is what they had to argue. Either they had to argue that those who participated in the violence of November 9th, 1938 had violated then operative uh, German law, or they had to concede that participants in, say, Kristall Nacht were guilty of nothing because they, their actions were authorized by the law of the time. Now, taken to its logical extreme, German jurists might have concluded that no one who participated in the extermination of the Jewish population of Europe could be tried for anything because the exterminatory acts violated no law that had been in place during the Third Reich. Now, if they had reached that latter conclusion, that result would have been to use the technical legal term, the technical legal term for that conclusion that no one could have been tried for any crime at all uh, for having participated in the extermination of the Jewish population of Europe, that conclusion would have been, technically speaking, crazy. And the reason I say crazy is because it would have incredibly tarnished the post-war Germany's um, attempt to rehabilitate its image in the in the eyes of the post-war world. So optics notwithstanding, did Nazi atrocities constitute crimes under the law that had been operative at the time? Now, it's interesting to observe that even historians and jurists today will offer conflicting answers to this basic question. Let's look at something else besides the November pogrom. Let's look very briefly at Hitler's directive of October 1939. And this was the directive that authorized uh, the killing of those suffering from mental and physical disabilities. In a recent book um, called Reckonings, um, Legacies of Nazi Persecution and the Quest for Justice, uh, a very prominent uh, British historian named Mary Fulbrick, she wrote the, wrote the following. She wrote that, quote, Hitler's directive, that is, this directive that authorized the killing of those suffering from mental and physical disabilities, was never legalized. It only had the force of Hitler's personal order, not the force of law. Okay, so that's basically saying that Hitler was in violation of the criminal law at the time. But what does that mean? What does it mean to say the force, what does the force of law mean in the context of a criminal state like the Third Reich? Because leading both German and American scholars, 
of the law of the Third Reich have argued that in that deformed legal world, the will of the Führer indeed had the force of law. In fact, these scholars go on to say that the will of the Führer constituted law and it didn't matter if it was in a written form or an oral form or even in a secret order. Now, by way of response, this uh, historian Fulbrook says, well, Hitler's order couldn't have been law because, quote, it was never translated into legislation. But again, what does that mean in the context of a criminal state such as the Third Reich? Hitler's Germany didn't have a functioning legislature. In fact, Hitler's Germany vested the legislative process directly in the executive, that is, in Hitler himself. So to contrast Nazi legislation with Hitler's secret orders or oral commands is, in a sense, it's to offer a distinction without a difference. Now, I want to make sure that you understand this is not just an academic debate. It really goes to the very heart of the question of whether German courts would be able to charge former Nazis with having committed crimes that were crimes at the time. Now, what did they ultimately do? Well, ultimately, post-war post German jurors did conclude that the Nazis had committed atrocities that were in violation of the law at the time. And basically what they did is they said that uh, in the Third Reich, this Strafgesetzbuch just means like German criminal code. And they basically said that um, the Nazis had been in violation of the German criminal code at the time. And therefore German prosecutors in the post-war period, they charged a number of former Nazis under the murder statute that was contained in this book during the Nazi period. And in handing down convictions using the German murder statute, murder statute uh, operative uh, during the Third Reich, these post-war German courts in effect concluded that the administration of justice, but not the law itself, had been hijacked by Hitler and his gang. That is, the law itself had remained intact, even if at the time it was unenforceable, and even if at the time the Nazi leaders had been the worst violators. What would I call that conclusion? I would call that conclusion a legal fiction. Now, it was certainly a convenient legal fiction, and I would probably say it was a necessary legal fiction. That is, it solved the problem that Germans faced as a result of rejecting crimes against humanity as a piece of ex post facto allied law. So this legal fiction did permit prosecutors to at least charge some former Nazis with having committed, let's say, murder. But if you study this thing more closely, the need to pigeonhole acts of state-sponsored terror and extermination into the Reich's ordinary murder statute, well, that created huge complications for post-war prosecutors. And I can't go into this in great detail uh, at the moment. I've written about this in, in some great length in this book, uh, The Right, Wrong Man. But suffice it to say that having to rely on the then operative murder statute made it very hard to convict uh, former Nazis, even of very substantial atrocities. And to those uh, inclined to cynicism, we might say that was the point. And finally, I think we can say that in adopting this legal fiction, the post-war German jurist never really absorbed the disturbing truth that our philosopher Karl Jaspers, remember who we discussed at the beginning of the talk, the disturbing truth that Jaspers located at the heart of the uh, criminal state. Remember that Jaspers insisted that the criminal state, it actually reveals that the law itself can be utterly deformed into an instrument of atrocity and destruction. And that radical conclusion, that radical conclusion was one that post-war jurists either could not or would not accept. So I will uh, stop there and, um, and I'd be happy to um, entertain whatever uh, questions you may have.
Thank you, Professor Douglas, for this wonderful talk and uh, for educating us on um, quite important aspects of the trials that I'm sure many of us were really um, hearing for the first time, especially explained in uh, such a way. So uh, we're grateful um, to you for uh, taking your time and joining us today and doing this. And uh, I'm just going to remind our um, attendees that uh, the chat box is for you to write your questions. Um, so please go ahead and uh, do it uh, now. And uh, while we are waiting for our questions, well, okay, uh, I see that the questions are already jumping in. Um, so uh, one of the questions that we have here is, uh, what was reporting in newspapers and magazines like at time of Nuremberg trials? Uh, so uh, I guess we can ask like the reporting in um, United States, reporting in Germany. I mean, Nuremberg, basically, uh, it attracted a huge, a tremendous amount of international attention, tremendous amount of international attention. Um, that international attention, as in with any spectacular trial, it wanes pretty quickly. Um, so uh, there are people, New York Times, a lot of these newspapers, they had a correspondent there for much of the trial, but very memorably, um, uh, Rebecca West, Rebecca West, very famous uh, uh, British writer, she was covering the trial for the uh, British paper, The Daily Telegraph, and she, um, writing about Nuremberg as the trial developed, she described it as, very famously, as a citadel of boredom. And she said, this is not just ordinary boredom, this is boredom on a like a world historical scale. Now you think, how can that possibly be? How can this you know, spectacular trial, the first international criminal trial in human history, how could it have been incredibly dull? And this gets, uh, it's, it's not exactly directly germane to uh, what we were talking about earlier, but one of the things that kind of drained Nuremberg of the attention, now again, there were some moments of that were really quite spectacular and that people would write about, but on a day-to-day -day level during the 11th months that it lasted, uh, it got quite boring. And one of the reasons it quite, uh, got quite boring is that the prosecution relied very heavily on captured Nazi documents. And they thought it was actually part of a conscious prosecutorial strategy. They thought, oh, if we rely on uh, eyewitnesses, eyewitnesses can always be attacked on cross-examination. People can say that eyewitnesses are exaggerating what they're saying. But if we rely on the Nazis' own documents, well, how can we possibly, uh, how can the defense possibly challenge the documents of their own making? Well, the problem with relying on documents means you have to present them in evidence. And presenting them evidence means you have to read them. And so unfortunately, a lot of the Nuremberg trial was devoted to reading documents into the, into the uh, transcript, reading them before court. And not only did the prosecutors have to read them, they had to read them slowly. And why did they have to read them slowly? because the trial was being conducted in four different languages. And so you had these simultaneous interpreters who basically had to have the time to uh, hear what they were being said. So I'll just take some article that I have nearby. So if the article is, I happen to have an article about crimes against humanity right here. That's what I do in my free time, people. I read this kind of thing. So it'd be like, in the autumn of 1940, Hirsch, Lauder, that's how the kind of the trial unfolded. So it did receive a tremendous amount of international attention, a lot of international press, but some of that press, it didn't necessarily satisfy the desires for spectacle that the international press had expected at the outset. Thank you. Yeah. Um, another question would be about international law, because there is so much discussion um, 
with developments in the world, what is the role of international law in general? Does it even work? Um, so connecting with, of course, the conversation um, that you are leading today, um, the first question would be, um, what was the role of the Nuremberg trials on international law? How did it affect the development of international law um, and the decisions made there? But also, I would like to hear your opinion about international law in general, uh, especially in terms of does it work when it, we are looking for it, um, for its help? <laughs> right. Well, OK, I'll start with the, the first problem, the, this issue about um, what kind of role did um, Nuremberg play in the development of, let's say, contemporary international criminal law? And I would say Nuremberg is clearly the most important precedent in the development of international criminal law, by far the most important precedent. That said, I would say that, uh, and again, I don't think this is, I, I hope this isn't really technical, it, just the, if you look at what international law looks like today, Nuremberg, as I said, really focused on this thing called crime against peace, for focusing on wars of aggression. That is no longer really at the center of international criminal law. International criminal law really focuses more on war crimes, crimes against humanity, and something that was not yet recognized as an international crime yet at Nuremberg, namely genocide. The term genocide was actually, it was first coined. Genocide is a pretty new term. It was only coined in 1945, uh, 1944 by this uh, Polish jury, uh, Jewish jurist named Ralphiel Lemkin, who at the time was working as an advisor to the US War Department. And he wrote a book called um, Axis Rule in Occupied Europe. And he tried to kind of find a, a term in order to describe the treatment of the Jewish population in occupied Europe by the Nazis. And what he did is he took a um, Greek word for group, if you remember from like biology, like genus, like, so he took this word genus from the Greek, and he took the Latin word for killing side, like homicide, suicide, put them together, and it came up with the word genocide. Uh, genocide as a term was used by prosecutors at Nuremberg, but it wasn't understood as its own independent crime until the framing of the Genocide Convention in 1948. So if you looked at international criminal law today, um, it's less focus on aggression, more focus on crimes against humanity, genocide, and war crimes. Does aggression ever get any attention? Well, it certainly did after February 14th, uh, 2022, uh, which of course is the date of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, where suddenly people became very concerned again with this crime of uh, aggression. Um, so those four crimes really describe the center of international criminal law. Does international criminal law work? Well, I guess it depends what you mean by work. Um, I would say that, you know, if you have that old um, uh, cliche of, well, is the cup half full or the cup half empty? I suppose with international criminal law, we could say, is the cup nine tenths empty and one tenth full? And I would say, yes, it is one tenth full. So does it really work well? Well, again, we have to recognize limitations on internet. Is there anything like an international police force? No. Is there any way that uh, is Putin going to be tried for before an international court for let's say atrocities that took place that are taking place in Ukraine? Probably not. On the other hand, has international criminal law had some real achievements? And the answer is. Yes. And some of the achievements are in terms of convictions. Like, for example, uh, there were people who were responsible for the Rwandan genocide that unfolded in the spring of uh, 1993. And, um, and, uh, and those people, you know, did they have to, were they held responsible? Yes, they were held responsible. Uh, all of them? No. Were the people who are held responsible for atrocities during the Balkan Civil War? Yes, including Slobodan Milosevic, who is the former um, uh, Serb president, and Radovan Karadzic, the former head of the breakaway 
um, little Serb Republic um, in uh, Bosnia. So, you know, there are some pretty notable uh, achievements. And, um, but again, there are a lot of um, very substantial shortcomings as well. Mm -hmm. And in connection with that, because you mentioned about genocide and Rafael Lemkin, one of the um, ideas that also um, uh, influenced his search for the term was also cultural genocide, right? And since Kristallnacht pretty much sounds like the <laughs> embodiment of um, that, what 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 do you think about that the connection yeah um, well again i don't want to start like you know playing technical legal thing technically as a technical legal matter um if you look at the genocide convention in 1948 lemkin very much wanted to include cultural genocide in the definition of uh genocide that was going to be framed by the united nations that was ultimately rejected so cultural genocide as a technical matter, for better or worse, is not part of the definition of genocide. On the other hand, um, I think we can certainly say that when one group or nation is trying to destroy another group, um, they will very often attack all forms of that group. So uh, attacking cultural artifacts, places of worship, uh, cultural institutions, that can certainly be evidence of genocidal intent, even if it technically speaking isn't, you know, part of the formal definition of genocide. So I think the, the point that you're making is very well taken. Right. Uh, we have um, another <clears throat> question. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the question is, which German law was the basis uh, of the 1965 German war trials? So the uh, so the the trial that took place between um, 1963 and 1965. This is the the um, the Frankfurt Auschwitz trial. Kind of lasted two years, and uh, during this trial, there were 22 functionaries. Excuse me, there were 22 functionaries of um, the Auschwitz killing center were uh, put on trial in Frankfurt, and they were all charged with murder under that um, German legal code that I talked about. And in fact, the only thing they could be charged with was murder. There was nothing else that they could be charged with. Why? Well, because the German criminal code had statutes of limitations for every other crime. So just to understand that. So let's say a, um, a, a functionary at, um, at Auschwitz testified before the court and someone said, what did you do during your time as an SS guard at Auschwitz? And the person answered, I beat Jewish inmates within an inch of their life every single day for two and a half years straight. That person could have been convicted of absolutely nothing uh, in Germany after the year 1960, basically after the year 1950. So the only thing, the only thing that was not controlled by statute of limitations was um, murder. And without getting into too complicated of a discussion, even the statute of limitations uh, had originally applied to murder and the Germans, again, largely because of international pressure, they lifted that statute of limitations to permit prosecutions to go forward. But that's basically why I said uh, at the towards the conclusion of my presentation that every single act of Nazi atrocity had to be shoehorned into the statutory murder, into the definition of statutory murder. Nothing else was available to German prosecutors um, basically after 1960. Right. Well, thank you for addressing these questions and thank you to our audience for raising these um, questions. And I believe we will need to wrap up. Uh, we kept you for quite some time with uh, for your fascinating uh, talk. And um, uh, I um, hope that our audience will be following our web page and our emails uh, with regards to all the future events that Change is um, programming and 
Um, at the beginning, we also shared uh, some of those upcoming events on our slides. Uh, so we have both Zoom and in-person programming that is going to happen both in fall, winter, and in spring. And we hope you all uh, will join us. And today, um, once again, I will thank you, Professor Douglas. And I want to thank our changes staff, Suzanne, uh, Rachel, uh, Susan, and Linda for uh, helping us to make this program on Zoom possible. And I um, wish everyone a good night. Hope you all um, stay safe. And I don't want to forget to also thank our sponsors, our donors, and members for their continued support.